All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for Thursday, May 19th, 2022. Thanks for joining us today. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. Where in the world are you? We're here for you. We're glad that you're here and we're glad that you're joining us. If you've if we've never met before, my name's Jeff. I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar and you said 2022 is my year and you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 29 years and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. Great to have all of you here with us. I'm looking at my screen right now, and I see Scott Thrift joining us. He says it's a sunny bay day, sunny day on the bay. Thanks for joining us from San Francisco today, Scott. He's joining us over uh, from over on LinkedIn. And uh, first in the room means that he is the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award for the first person into the room. Ed Shannon, I see you on Facebook from Des Moines, Iowa. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Mark Arlapage, good day from North Carolina. You're our uh, guest today. I can't reveal too much yet, but our guest today is not far away from where you are today. Uh, Rod, welcome back from Monroe, Louisiana on the front porch. Glad that you're here. And uh, Warren Kermit Allen III says, Rain Bennett, shh, we're not revealing our guest yet, but Rain Bennett caused my success. That's an awesome, that's an awesome statement. <laughs> Glad to hear it. And Scott Thrift has jumped over to, uh, to Facebook as well today. Chris, welcome back from, uh, from Massachusetts. He says, well, hello there for a bit. We'll have to catch the replay for whatever he misses. Well, we're glad you, that you uh, checked in today. Chris, glad that you're here. If you are joining from somewhere, probably Facebook, and you're commenting away, right? you're watching, you're listening, you're you're commenting, uh, you're typing things into the comments, and they're not showing up on the screen, it probably means that you are in a closed private Facebook group, and Facebook has these rules that says that your name and your comments and your picture can't be let out of those private groups. However, if you would like to change that, if you would like your comments to show up on the screen like Scott's does and Warren's does and Rod's and Mark and Ed's do, then all you have to do is give Facebook permission to speak with Restream, which is this platform that we use for streaming here. So there is a URL in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen right now that does chat.restream.io slash FB like Facebook. Surely I can see you now. It's like a sprint commercial. Uh, Chat.restream.io slash FB like Facebook. Uh, type that into your browser and it will give permission for Facebook to talk to Restream. Now, if it's the first time that you've been here, you probably need to do that. If you've been here before, it is possible that those permissions have expired. I don't know what the dates are. I don't know if it's three months or six months or three days or three hours. I don't know what it is, but they do expire at some point. So if it's not working chat.restream.io slash FB. That's really the answer to all of your problems. That solves everything. Um, you know, if we could get that into uh, to uh, government and, and everywhere else, all of our all of our problems would be solved. Chat.restream.io slash FB would, uh, would take care of everything. So uh, give that a shot if you're typing away and not showing up on the screen. As usual, for these conversations on Thursdays, our Context and Clarity Live conversations, I am joined by Catherine McPhail. Hi, Catherine. Hi, hey, Jeff. Welcome back from Massachusetts. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, every time you say 2022 is my year or whatever, of course, 2020 is my year, 2021 is my year, 2022. And I thought, I have so much time, but now 2022 is almost halfway over. And um, I don't know what happened. And this morning in Clubhouse, you said it's March 19th. And I thought, that feels much better. It feels like March 19th. But <laughs> Oh, did I say March 19th this morning? But I felt, okay. I felt reasonable to me this morning. Anyway, 
it's just flying by. I don't know if this is going to be my year after all. That's all I'm trying to say. Well, if it Actually, makes you feel, if it f- makes you feel any worse, um, we're a week and a half away from the beginning of the third quarter. Is that right? What? Do I have that right? I have that possible. June, the beginning of June. <laughs> I don't know. You're right. You're right. Thank you for putting it that way. That does make just, me feel worse. Yeah. Well. Just, just throwing that out there <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> Let's see. Melanie, welcome back from Charlotte and Ken Crutcher from Detroit. Uh, Mark says, it sounds like Catherine's mic is not working. It's very quiet. Yeah. She's, uh, Sarah Lee says they can barely hear you. Oh, you wouldn't want that. So, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, ch- We'll check on that as we go. Thank you for that heads up, everybody. Uh, Rod says 2023 will be your year. So, Yeah, I do like the number 23. It's a better number. There you go. Okay. Well, you, I guess you're hanging on for next year. Warren says the architect language should allow mindfulness and intent to reach. I've got to flip over here and find the rest of Warren's comment. Uh, to reach the intellectual and accessible curriculum. Wow. Um, all right. Maybe we'll talk about that. That's a that's a lot of big words. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> it's sure what it means. Think, so let's talk about that. I, I think that's so what that reminds me of is this idea uh of jargon. And a friend of mine out in California named Kathy Clotes Guest, um, another storyteller, she has this uh, saying about jargon monoxide poisoning. So uh, don't yeah. poison your clients with jargon monoxide. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that today. Is there an antidote pro- to um, jargon monoxide poisoning? Yeah, don't use jargon. But if you already did it, anyway. Well, I don't know. I don't know. You may uh, you may have to find an antidote for your uh, for your clients there. We'll see. We'll maybe we can ask our guests that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe I should introduce him. Yeah. All right. Our guest today is a filmmaker and a keynote speaker. He's a storyteller and author, and he might even be a TikTok star. He's the director of video production at Six Second Stories and the author of the book by the same name, Six Second Stories. Rain Bennett, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Great to have you here. Um, and, and it looks like, uh, well, obviously, you know Warren Kermit Allen the third because he I mean he gave you quite an endorsement at the very beginning. Right. I'll take it. I'll take whatever I can get, Jeff. <laughs> that was fantastic. Glad that glad that you're here. Um I love I love storytelling. I when I went out on my own, I built my business around storytelling for architects. At at that at the early point, mainly uh storytelling in the realm of social media, but that's evolved over time. Mm-hmm. And so uh when I first found you on Clubhouse or or on uh on TikTok and we first connected, that was you know, I, I had found a kindred spirit. So I'm absolutely I'm glad to finally ha- have you here on uh Context and Clarity Live with us. Yeah, I think that platform, it might be better than any other for a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. Like I have found, um, well, first of all, I'm sorry to say this, Jeff, but our story there isn't unique. Like I have, I have found lots of kindred spirits on there and I yep. think it, it's yep. added a lot of value to me. Hopefully it's not unique uh, for your journey as well, but like the algorithm puts you together with your, your people, I think better than any yep. other. And so there are a lot of people whom I've never met in person. You are one of those that right. like i feel like we're friends and we can talk about stuff at length you know all, all day long and not just our work so um that this is one of those uh uh happy little little things that uh, uh about the work that we do is making these connections and that's what storytelling is is making connections yeah well th- I mean, that's a great way to start you know it's it's about making connections but um what is a story maybe we should start there what what is a story a story is a sequence of events that have affected change, transformation. Okay. So it what a story is, this is I mean, we could have a whole conversation just on this because it gets so misconstrued and so like humans tend to do, overcomplicated, right? A story is an event, a sequence of events, right? Beginning, middle, and end, like Aristotle said. But it's not just any sequence of events. 
you can tell a story that has no bearing, no weight, no impact on anyone. It needs that element of transformation. Something must have changed. I once was lost and now I am found, right? A tr transformation, even a small one, equals a story. So that's the way I like to describe it as a sequence of events that has affected, it created some transformation. But and I love that you started there because I think, you know, again, you know, we're here talking about storytelling in in the context of, of business and specific that's to make your client's life better. It's that transformation piece of it. And I think that's why story is, well, one of the reasons this isn't the first time I've said it like that. In fact, that's the way I define what a story is for the people that I, I, I work with is that often we think about it as like, Oh, I need, I need help telling my story. What's my story. We need to tell our brand story. And I'm going to tie this back to Catherine because Catherine said, I thought 2022 was going to be my year. Here's the thing, Catherine and everyone else. You don't have one year. 2022 is not going to be your year. 22 is going to be your year and 23 and 24 and hopefully, you know, much further. And so was 2020. The bad ones are yours too. They're all yours. Okay. Similarly, you don't have one story. This is my story that doesn't exist. They're all your stories. You have a countless, endless, a myriad of stories to tell. What we do is we psych ourselves out and think, I have to tell my brand story, my life story, these big stories. And you can't. You can't unless you have days, weeks, months, right? You're talking about covering your whole life in a story. So let's reduce it. Let's make it simple. A story is a sequence of events that has effected some change that caused transformation, a change of perspective, a revelation, right? Change in behavior, growth, anything like that. So my trip to go take my kids to school in the morning could have resulted in a powerful story if there was something that happened, a sequence of events that created that transformation in me. And I left that journey to take my kids to school with a newfound perspective on something. That's a story. So people tend to complicate it and put too much weight and pressure on it. Just like, and sorry to pick on you, Catherine, I love you already. So I feel like I, I can <laughs> is it, we put too much pressure on that. Like, and it is, and I'm saying this out of love because I do the same thing to myself. I wanted to do so much in the first few months of this year. And the reality was COVID Omicron, you know, my kids were out of school for 26 days out of January. It was brutal. So I didn't get to accomplish those things. This is still my year, right? It's it, I still have to own this one too. And so we can't put all this pressure on one story and one year to define our success, to define our marketing, to define our lives. Every day is a story. Every moment is the potential of a story. And I will step down a little bit now, but you can tell I get passionate about this. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I like the passion though. And it, in. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and the, you know, when we're thinking about, again, if you're, if you're an architect and the stories that you're telling, um, there, there are lots and lots of stories. Yeah. So I'm glad you moved, moved just, your mic. Just there. answered a question without saying a word. There you go. That's the story. <laughs> Rain's t-shirt says, this is for Ed Shannon. Your story matters. Is that your, the, is that yes. your merch, Rain? That is, I'm, I made this shirt. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, yes, but it's not, you know, it's just, a, a, I did a TEDx talk in the, in the fall and they were like, is that your logo? Because we don't really want to promote business. It's like, no, it's just a sentence. It's just a sentence. It's not my business. Just want to, just want to remind you. So this is to, this is to all you folks out there listening to today's conversation. Your story matters. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good point. You know, it, it's, <sighs> There, there are so if we take an architect's website as a for instance, there's lots of places you can tell stories and you do tell stories. If you if you take your website, for instance, the the importance of the words on that on those pages, right? And the stories that are there. When when you're working with your clients, Rain, mm -hmm. what what's the biggest struggle that people have? Um you know, you mentioned the brand story, but but all all of the business storytelling. What's the biggest struggle yeah. that, that your clients have? The first one we've already touched on, right? Um, like my story is too big, and I always use this because I'm a filmmaker, right? So I always bring it back to film and television, and I'm like, "What's the favorite TV show of yours?" And people will be like, "Whatever, you know, Sopranos, Yellowstone, whatever." Let's take Sopranos. There was, I think, six seasons, maybe seven of that show. 
you trying to tell your whole brand story is like the Sopranos, the whole, the, you know, the whole series, right? Because the series has an arc and like mm -hmm. those little Russian Matroshka stacking dolls, they all, they little arcs fit within that arc that are identical in shape and structure, but they're smaller, right? So each season has its own arc. Each episode has its own arc. Each act of each episode each scene in each act etc etc right and so people think that they have one brand story to tell and you don't right it's a sequence of events that it has affected change so you could tell the story of your first client you could tell the story of how you pivoted in the pandemic i'm spitballing here right but you had you have countless so that's the first problem is people think we need to tell our brand story and i'm like well which one tom you know you which one like you have you have a million you have a myriad right the second problem is understand and i'm going right to sarah lee here all she says all this week i have been wondering what story do i need to tell and to whom who is my audience my clients etc cetera, etc cetera. like which story do i tell when and how etc that's the, that's the second one right okay i know i've got good stories i don't know how to choose which one so in brand storytelling and business storytelling there's such a simple three three part model that we're going to use to reverse engineer it right because as Jeff said, your website is a place to tell a story. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Everywhere is a place to tell a story because all storytelling is, again, let's not overcomplicate it, humans. That's what we love to do. All it is is the way humans communicate. That's it, okay? It's not this big, fluffy, obscure marketing word, you know, touchy-feely thing. It's just how we communicate. We don't communicate through lists of data and stats and product features. We communicate through emotion and narrative. I could veer off and tangent into the neuroscience, but how about we just like suffice it to say, trust me or Google it, right? It's been proven time and time again. This is how humans have always communicated since the beginning of communication. If you want me to go into that like esoteric world, we can do that too. All right. So here's the three part structure for when you're thinking of like, I have to write a post. I am writing an email for my Monday weekly tips. I'm doing my next, you know, four, four o'clock uh, contacts and clarity. Like, what are we going to focus on here? Okay. So the first thing is we're all doing it for a purpose. If you're not, if you don't have a, an objective attached to any business decision you're making, okay, you're already, that's already like a, a foul there. Okay. So you want to think about what is the action I want them to take? We're reverse engineering it. We're starting with the end goal. Okay, Sarah Lease and everyone else. What do I want them to do? Is it buy my book? Uh, download this free PDF so you're on my email newsletter list. Donate to this uh, this uh, fun, fundraiser. What is the action I want them to take after f uh, uh, viewing or reading or hearing this story? What do I want them to do? And if you don't know what the answer is, you got some work to do. You need to know what you want them to do. Because scientifically, we can prove that when certain neurochemicals are elevated in their brains due to hearing a good story, they will take action, okay? And so, what is the action you want them to take? And then we reverse engineer it. What is the emotion that they need to feel in order to be inspired to take that action? What emotion do we need to evoke, right? Is it hope? Is it anger is it fomo the fear of missing out like what what do we want them to feel because we make decisions as humans based off of our feelings and our emotions okay now we we reverse engineer one more step to the first step what is a story or the story that i can tell that will evoke that emotion to inspire that action what action do i want them to take what emotion do they need to feel to take that action to be inspired to take that action and what story do i need to tell them to evoke that emotion, to inspire that action. I, I imagine for a lot of the uh, people in the audience right now, small firm architects, they may have on their website a, um, it, and again, like Rain said, I mean, we're stories everywhere, right? I, I keep going back to the website as the example, but on example. your website or or at the end of the, uh, the email that you send out, um, You've got a call to action somewhere. There, there may be a button that says uh, "Book a call with me." That's that's what right. we that's what we want them to do. So, um, what what might we what kind of story might we tell to? That's that's a pretty broad thing. That, you know, book okay, a call. I got but, this. I got this. But, <laughs> but what what kind of story might we tell to drive people towards that? To booking a call with you. Yeah. Okay. With a, with a small firm architect. 
Yeah, sure. This really applies to anybody. I mean, you need to. So, okay, let's let's use let's work to shop the model we just said. We want them to book a yeah. call with us. Okay. So, what is an emotion? What what are they going to need to feel to then be motivated to click that button to book some time on my Calendly link? Right. Yep. Well, they need to feel first of all like I can solve the problem they're dealing with. Yeah. Right. They need to feel uh yeah com comfortable, confident. Right. They need to feel like I have something that they need. Right. Okay. So what's the step before that? What story can I tell them? I tell them a story that show, this is just an example. I would tell them a story of a similar, a person dealing with a similar struggle that they are. And this is where it comes into knowing who your audience is and what they're dealing with and listening. Right. So I tell them a story that shows not tells, right. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a classic. That's like a number one rule in screenwriting is you have to show not to tell. So I don't tell them I can help you with this. I sh tell them a story that shows them I can do that. So, uh, it, let's An say example from, of a past client, yeah, a past project. client, anything like that, or, you know, a, a person who's, you know, who's, who's struggling with what they're struggling with. And this, you know, this would help them. So another tool and device that we use in storytelling is called, uh, open loops and close and closed loops, right? All that is, is a fancy word for saying like, asking a question and answering a question okay and this is how you sequence stories so it keeps people wanting to go uh, to stay paying attention until the next thing happens and this spikes our dopamine so we're like we want more of it. it's like a drug right and so any movie that you see one scene or sequence happens as a direct result from what happened before that okay this happened therefore this happened so this thing happened, right? It's a sequence of events that one thing leads to the next, okay? So you each scene opens a loop or creates a problem or creates tension and then releases that tension. That is the ebb and flow, folks, of a story. So a good way to do that, like when, as humans, again, this is neuroscience, when there is an open loop, we have a deep hunger and thirst to close that loop it's it's psychological it's neurological like we have to know what happened we have to get the answer to that so you can also tease them like you know this person was struggling through that until they signed up you know for my course or my whatever and then after that you know we we, we show a little bit of the success that happened but we don't give them the recipe well now they're like if it speaks to them it won't be everybody but if it speaks to them like oh my gosh that's exactly what i've been dealing with and i would also like those results but what did he do? What's the strategy? What What's the tactical like day to day actions I need to take? And my sign off is like, if you want to learn more, book a 15 minute free call with me. Well, then that's a very little investment for them that to possibly really solve a big problem for them. They will take that action. OK, yeah, so that, right. that's just a little trick of the trade where it's like and pe pe people know this. You call it a bunch of things, cliffhangers, whatever hooks, you know, people understand these things, but you have to kind of buy in you got to get them to buy in emotionally first so that then they're leaning in asking you well okay but how do i do it instead of dumping all the information on them at first and then they're like they're overwhelmed and overloaded you, you drop it like little a trail of breadcrumbs right you give them that little morsel that leads to the next one and, and lets them come to you instead of jumping in front of their face and being pushy and that's the power of storytelling versus like selling yeah yeah, I think that's a really great point. And, you know, Sarah Lee's question, she also asked, who's my audience? Is it, is it my clients? And I think for a lot of us, we're, we're, we automatically jump to clients, but that's one audience. Yeah. I mean, what if you want to your hire co your coworkers are, are, are an sure. audience, your, your potential hires. I have yeah. a, uh, this is kind of a apropos of, of what we're talking about today. I, ha I had a client that's a custom remodeler. And he hired my company for a series, a campaign, because they were scaling and they were looking to find good qualified uh, workers. And so they did like an ad campaign to 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 recruit great talent. And so we made basically commercials for, you know, to showcase what was so great about working at that company for potential new hires. And I thought I was so proud of them because that's something I would have like coached someone to do. But they came to me with the idea and I was like, you guys are on it. Like, I love this. And we had a great, uh, beautiful campaign called Join the Family because they gave like incredible uh, uh, benefits and they created this whole family feel and family vibe uh, at the at the um, at the company. And they all hung out and watched Carolina Panthers games together on Sundays. And it was like a place that people were really 
happy and privileged to work at. And we promoted that and it, and it, and it helped. It worked for them. So yeah, your audience is whomever you're trying to get to take action. It could be the, the potential donors in the audience. It could be certainly clients. That's the easy one. But you use, this is what I want to kind of break people out of the mindset of storytelling only for sales and marketing, right? Because it is just communication. So you can use stories to get, you know, bind a community together to, to strengthen and grow a community. You can use stories to innovate and design to build a, build a product or build a product feature or a service. You can use storytelling to design that before, you know, to innovate that you can use stories to navigate trauma. You can use stories to, I mean, to, it's how we communicate, right? It's how we connect as humans. So what you do with that connection once established is totally up to your mission and your objective, but it's not just a marketing tool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, we, we think about what it, what it takes to be an architect, you know, what the, what the practice of architecture is like. And of, of course, with, like with every business, you've, you've got to find the work. So there's the marketing and business development piece of it, but then there's the design process and, and communicating with clients and, and, um, and maybe in certain circumstances, it's, presenting the design to the city council or to the university board or whatever it is. So there's, there's lots and lots of places where, where story, um, storytelling would come into the equation. Like you said, it's, it's communication. Um, w one thing that I think, or one place area where I think many architects might struggle with this idea <laughs> is the idea of, you know, how do I, how do I set myself apart maybe from other architects, you know, demonstrate my uniqueness. And the, I think that's a great, a, a great place to talk about it, but it reminds me, this question reminds me of the significant objects. Um, yeah. St study or, or, well, it's a book too, but uh, significant objects. Can you tell us about, about uh, significant objects? Yeah, it was a study done about the power of storytelling and in, 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 in the descriptions of eBay items. Um, what was his name? Rob Walker and another another person. Basically, they bought a bunch of knickknacks on eBay um, for, I don't know, it's like $128. And they hired marketers and writers and people like myself to craft these narratives, these stories and descriptions. And listen, I'll flash forward. Like I've used this tactic in Facebook Marketplace and et cetera, like to make a story around the, the thing you're selling. Um, and they ended up selling that for like, I don't know, it was a ridiculous amount of money, like thousands of dollars for $128 of items. And, you know, I posted a, a TikTok video about it because it's a great example of it working. Um, and there's a lot of people that a lot of trolls that chimed in, like great, taking advantage of people, you know, yada, yada, yada. First of all, the money was all like donated to the writers and marketers. Um, but it's, it just shows you it's like it's value is in the eye of the beholder and the client, right? So it's like, if I'm willing to pay more for that knick knickknack because it's got a story behind it, that's totally up to me. There is no, there is no set inherent value for this little, uh, what do they, what do they call them? Uh, tchotchkes? Hmm. Right. Yeah. Like little knickknacks yep. that you have around your, your, your desk. I'm trying to look for some here. You know, there's no set value for those. It's what it means to you. And so there, if there's a coffee mug that my daughter made me, I have socks that I get on father's day for, with my daughter's little face on it. And it gets, gets read up every year with a newer one of her from that year, bro. How much are socks? Like five bucks, 10 bucks. Like those are priceless to me. Right. Yeah. That's a good, that's exactly the point that we're saying. Like you, you, People make decisions based off of their emotions. I'm not right. saying that logic and, and rationale doesn't play a part. Of course it does. And there are certain people, engineers, that really make decisions based off of X's and O's, right? But you're still, here's the thing, even with engineers, you're still appealing to the emotions or even someone who's really focused on the bottom line. You're still appealing to that emotion that cares about the money. Right. So like, it's not it's it's always about the problem you're sol solving, solving for them. And so significant objects was just a really good example of like, hey, how can you how you can just add a narrative to something? And it starts to mean more to people because we have our emotions are conjured up now. Otherwise, you're just saying like dorm fridge, 150 bucks. Right. But I, I use this tool. Now, first of all, I will say. 
you still have to have a good product, right? Like you have to have a right. good product. Right. You can't just, you know, have a great story and the product sucks and it works. But if you have a good product and terrible marketing and a good product and great marketing, you can imagine the results, right? People still yeah. want what they want, but it's about communicating what that you have what they want. That's where we get lost. And we're talking about our audience, right? So you need to know what you do differently than other people and for whom finding out your audience is so key now we're talking about our story the story we tell ourselves right i did a whole tedx talk on this that was based off of the concept that you know being different is better than being better and there's mm -hmm. a line that i say that like plenty of people out there and we're all do, we're all in the architectural space right plenty of people out there have your skills everybody on this call has your your skills you know you know, roughly, I don't know every person that's on that's on the call, right? But everybody's in the same space. So plenty of people have your skills and many of those people will be more skilled than you will ever be. But nobody on the face of this earth has your story. Not a single one. It's like a snowflake or a fingerprint, right? So you are doing yourself a complete disservice by not leveraging that. It's the one thing, the one thing that you own that nobody else can ever, ever own. Why are you not leaning into that more? I'll tell you why, because most of us don't even know what our unique story is and why we do what we do differently than other people. So you have to revert. You have to peel back those layers of the onion, too. This is an exact process that I take my coaching clients through. We go back to the beginning, baby. We go back to the things you've loved your whole life and still love things that you've picked up and loved along the way. We go back to what you've always been skilled at and what you're skilled at currently. And we look at all your lived experiences. And it's a three-part Venn diagram. And there's a handful of things that exist right in the middle, right in the heart of that Venn diagram. And we start to see the picture there. We start to see the story emerge because I promise you, no matter how much you think you fell into the world that you're in, you didn't. It happened for a reason. And all those elements, your skills, your passions, and your experiences played a part in that path. And once you find out the reason it happened, now you're cooking with gas, as we say in the South. Now you really have a story to tell. Then you're able to identify your audience. So your first thing you need to understand is what is your unique perspective on the work that you do in the world, right? That's 100% determined by your unique experiences. I could give 100 filmmakers $100,000 to all do a... Uh, uh, I don't want to brand anything to all do a film about smartphones, right? Same money, same topic. And they will all 100 films be different. Why Jeff and Catherine? Because we're all different, right? We're all, all completely different. Our perspectives are different. So stop trying to be competitive and be better than the other people and play their race and figure out, go against the grain. What do you do differently? And once you realize how you view the world differently than other people, then you ask yourself the question, so what subsect of people, what, what group of or a population of people would benefit most from that? I'll give you an example straight from my life. As a filmmaker, I was never, I am not very technical. I'm not a great cinematographer. I don't like to edit. I don't like to do the technical things. I love the heart of the story and I love storytelling, but as an independent low budget documentary filmmaker, I had to wear all the hats and do all the things. And, you know, my insecurity flared up because I thought I would never be great, but I still plunged forward with, with a story and a film that I wanted to create and took me years and years. And, and, and we finally had some success and we sold it to a, a streaming channel, Red Bull TV. And through that whole process, I realized, and it was a slow, gradual realization transformation, right? I realized that that like that had become my philosophy that it's story first and then like technical uh, know how and production value second, not the other way around. Now, you want both of them, ideally, but if you have all the production value, but no story, it doesn't work. It can work the other way around. So when I left that story and that process, that part of my journey, I'm like, who would benefit from my philosophy that I've now crafted and cultivated of like, Hey, you have all the tools you need right now to start, and then you add tools to the toolbox, but you focus on the story first. Well, everybody's a content creator now. Everybody has a business or a product or a cause they're trying to promote, but not everybody is a filmmaker or an artist or a writer. So do we think that they would benefit 
from someone who has built his whole philosophy off of being overwhelmed and under-resourced, but still able to connect with his audience? Absolutely. They don't have budget. They don't have a marketing team. They don't have fancy equipment. They just have their message they're trying to get across, and I help them get it across in the most effective and efficient way possible. So that's my people. I don't help Apple or Nike or Budweiser be great storytellers. They have the best agencies on the planet to do that. I help mom and pop shops, nonprofits, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, those types of people, underdogs, as I, I like to see them. I, th I think that's an important point because I know there are a lot of, and it's not just architects, it's, it's business owners, it's, it's human beings sure. that are afraid, right? Well, what if I tell this story and it doesn't resonate with so-and-so or, or you flip it around and go, okay, well, who are these people mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm trying to connect with? Um, and, 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 and then I guess what if, my story doesn't resonate with them. How do you, how do you bring all that together? You know, here's my story going back, you know, all the way, as, as you described it as part of your process, going all the way back in, in your existence, at what point as, as you're, you're creating that Venn diagram mm -hmm. and you're looking at what makes you unique, at what point do you make the leap then perhaps from, okay, this is what makes me unique to, who my audience actually is. I don't know. Does that make sense? I think so. Uh, uh, ideally, it's not so much a leap. There may be, I think it might be like this. There may be potential audiences that you could, that you could pursue, right? With the, those unique perspectives, those unique intersections that you have. Maybe you're lucky and it's like, oh, this is exactly the people I need to help because it's so specific, you know, your unique perspective. But most likely there's going to be a handful of people that you could. So then you have to go into like, well, what, who do you want to root for? Who do you want to fight for? And I have always wanted to to, to root, to fight for the people, the, the underdogs. That's why I said I view them that way, right? Also, people who are multi-passionate, that's people I identify with, or people who are building a business around themselves, Right. So I work a lot with realtors because they're effectively their own businesses. I work a lot with people who are influencers and creators because they they are the product. They're their businesses because that's me, right? And that's what I've had to do. So I respond better to them than big agencies or big, big companies. Um, I still work with a lot of companies, but I, I usually keep it smaller. And then some of it, Jeff, is just trial and error. Like when you're starting off, you kind of cast a wide net, right? And then you start to understand because sometimes who's resonating with your product or your service or your story isn't exactly who you intended on it being, you know, in the beginning. And you have the choice then to like veer a little bit and, and cater to these people who are hungry and thirsty for your content or like force it to go the other way. Cause your vision was to serve these people. And sometimes people do that. Right. But I think that the goal in business is to follow the people who want the thing that, that, that you have. Right. And that's a tricky one because, you know, sometimes people will dig their heels in and they don't necessarily want to do that. But it does take a little bit of practice and trial and error, I will say, because, um, you know, I, I've had that experience myself of like, well, do I want to coach young filmmakers? You know, do I want to help business people specifically or only? Like I said, I have a I have a history or family history in real estate and I've tend to, tended to work with realtors a lot. I could dive into that like and just really be the realtor storytelling guy. If I wanted to, I've yet to make that leap because that's not really what I want to do, but I probably could. So you kind of have to, you have to narrow it down and continue to narrow it down. So when you establish those unique intersections, what do I do differently? Then you kind of lay it all out again. Like, okay, what types of people would benefit from these unique perspectives that I, that I hold that I have. And there may be several of those. And then you're like, well, and and I'm sorry to say, but like if we're we're all in business here, I'm not sorry to say this, but it's like it's not always all about the money, but business is about the money. So sometimes it's like, well, who has got the finances to hire somebody like me? Right. I mean, yeah, that's important. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you you have to consider that. I mean, or hey, I want I have a family. I don't want to be on the road that much. Like, how can I maximize my my revenue? and minimize my trips, my trips or my hours. Right. I mean, that's something we're all interested in. So sometimes, you know, one audience is going to pay you very well and the other is always going to be a struggle. 
So that's that's always a big factor. I mean, we're in business here. Yeah. So when, let me ask a question. Do you mind if I, <clears throat> when you're helping real estate people, what kind of stories are they telling? And are they telling their clients trying to get people to sign up with them? And if they, if that's the case, what would they be telling personal stories or stories yeah. about a Listen. Or what? All kinds of stories. Personal stories work. Personal stories work really well because it, every story has the surface level story. This is the plot, the sequence of events, right? Mm -hmm. They all have the emotional story, which is what the story is really about. You know what I mean? Like whatever story that you love, whatever movie that you love, you know, Rocky is about a boxer who had a title shot, but you know, the story is really about like believing in oneself. Right. And, and, and it's, a, and a, you know, same thing with like many of those, that's, there's always that emotional journey and that's what we care about. That's why if there's a story where the goal isn't achieved, but the lesson is learned, the thing that the, the, the protagonist needed, we're okay with that as an audience, because that's the real story that we're here to watch. Right. It's not about the service level events. So you can tell a personal story in a business setting, if the lesson learned, the moral, right, the universal theme that it taps into, the heart of the story, whatever metaphor you want to use, if that is applicable to the business lesson. So if the lesson is something like letting go, but I told the story of driving my kids to school and almost getting in a wreck and getting triggered and then whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and the, the, the end result or the universal theme was letting go, then I can build that connection into the business world if that's the message i'm trying to get across okay so i just say that to say personal stories totally work doesn't have to be business stories i'll use my mom my mom's in real estate for 20 25 years she is in little washington north carolina it's a coastal town it's a historic town and she grew up there in the house she lives in now that i was raised in the old old, old uh you know 100 what year is it now 140 year old house or something like that right so she dominates the historic district but she loves that town. She's never left it. So she sells that town and her love for the town is infectious. And it's one of those towns that a lot of people are moving to retire. It's on a, it's got a very affordable property. It's on a beautiful river. So her love of the town is infectious. When people are there looking at this place, I mean, it pours out of her and she tells her story of just growing up here and what she loves about it. And they fall in love with it because of that. And that has nothing to do with, pricing or like any of the, the business of real estate, right? It's just about that. Then maybe they're um, an older couple who are empty nesters, right? We all know that term. Maybe they're empty nesters. And she, maybe she says, oh, I just helped this, you know, fabulous couple find, you know, a townhome that's one block from the water, but everything's covered because empty nesters are probably looking for something with low maintenance, right? Not a lot of square footage, but, but something that still gets to be downtown and near the water. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's I don't I want to get people out of this habit of like, what's the perfect story to tell? And I want people to understand that all around you are opportunities to tell stories. OK, another way of explaining a story is there is a problem. And there is a journey to solve that problem. Right. And that's the sequence of events and then a resolution of that problem. That's it. I can tell the story of trying to find something for breakfast this morning. There is a problem a journey to solve that problem, and then the resolution of that problem. Okay, that's that's all you need to know. And they're happening all around you. This event that we're doing right now is a story, right? Is it a story that will have impact on people? That That's to be determined, right? Not every story needs to be told. That's why that part about having affected change, having created change is so vital. It's not just a sequence of events. This show that we're doing is a sequence of events, right? Now, hopefully some of your listeners have gone through some transformation today. So they might have a story. Oh my God, I listened to Context and Clarity this week and they had this amazing guy, Rain Bennett on. You got to go buy his book. You got to book him, talk to him. He's the best in the world. But my life and business has changed since watching that. That's a story, right? So, so they're all around you. You have to determine which ones you want to pluck out of the sky and tell based off of what am I trying to achieve? What is the action I want them to take? What is the emotion I want them to feel? What is the story that I should tell? Uh, this morning, James, can you hear me okay? This morning, James wanted to know, how do we know what to add and what not to add? Mm. I guess that kind of connects to how long should the story be? This is, this I is, won't... sorry, go ahead. What? I won't put that one up because I think everybody asks you. Uh, I'm happy to answer whatever. You guys have me. 
to do with me what you will. Um, what parts to add and what parts to subtract? This is a great question. Um, there are certain details that help, but the goal of a story is to tell it as efficiently as possible. My company is called Six Second Stories. Now that's literal and figurative. Literal because now we have six second ad spots, like even on primetime television. Uh, but also sp specifically with YouTube bumper ads, with with TikTok, uh, you know, with all these very, very, you know, micro short form uh, um, uh, formats that we have. But also the goal of any story is to be as efficient as possible. OK, to cut out the fat, to get to the to, to the it's a, it's a lot like joke writing. I think it was Bill Burr that once said that, like, you know, a great joke was it, you whittle it down until you. If you couldn't remove one word, if you remove one word, this joke wouldn't work anymore. So you have to whittle it down to the bare bones where it still works and then take out anything else that is not needed. It's the same thing with storytelling, okay? Because we don't have a lot of time, you get right to the to the point. Okay, so you want to whittle down redundancies. You want to whittle down any fat or fluffy language, or especially redundancies. We do that all the time. We say multiple words or multiple sentences that effectively say the same thing. So you get to the core message, the root message of that line or that word. And if they're the same, you lose one, right? If you have three of them, you lose two. This happens all the time in documentaries. We have three sentences in a row that says ABC company was great to work with. You don't need three, you just need one, okay? So you trim all the fat and you just get to the bare bone essentials, the framework of the story. However, there are certain devices that you can use that will add to it. So, so sometimes it's an ebb and flow, right? So, so stories are all about specific tiny moments. That's that moment of, of revelation, of realization, of epiphany. So sometimes you want to zero in just for a second. And here's a little pro tip that you all can take with you for free. Uh, sensory details. We really respond emotionally to sensory details. What do I mean by that? Something you can touch, taste, feel, hear, right? So I, I used one one time where I was talking about how I was being nervous. I think this is a personal story that I was telling. I was nervous and I felt a bead of sweat run down the side of my face, right? Now that's an extraneous, you know, like an extra detail but it's one that really works because it anchors the people in that moment with me because they probably feel that beat of sweat too. And I give them the visual visual cue. Like I, I draw it down my face, right? So it anchors them to that moment. Here's one thing. There's a process called neural coupling that happens in your brain when you hear a good story and your brain lights up as if you are the one experiencing the story. I'll give you an example. If you're watching a horror movie, okay. And your heart's beating and your palms are sweating, you know, in your real mind that you're not in that movie, right? I hope you do. Your brain, folks, doesn't. Your brain doesn't. Your brain processes that information as if you are actually walking down that hallway knowing the monster is going to jump out and get you, okay? So you want to keep that connection with the people listening because they they are they're you're connected neurologically. And so when I say it anchors them and, and they probably feel that beat of sweat, their brain is processing that even if they don't, you know, aren't conscious of it. when I say a bead of sweat slowly drip down my face and that slows that story down. And it seems like it might be a little bit extra information. It's not because I'm, I'm, I'm using it strategically. So I have them locked in that moment because when you spike that emotion in them, the information that is on either side of that emotion is packaged in there and it's remembered. So you can use those details, a sound, a specific moment. So adjectives can be really strong. What you don't want to do is just run off and be colorful or try to be clever instead of clear or being pretentious or jargony with your language. You want to be clear above all else. But when you get really good and you can flex on them a little bit, you start to learn these tools that you can have. However, what's the whole philosophy and the premise and the crux of the conversation today? Start where you are. Then add tools to the toolbox. The one I just gave you is more like an intermediate, close to a master level tool, okay? You don't need that at first. You need to understand how to clearly communicate your, your message to your audience. Then you understand how to hook them so they can't get away, right? You add tools to the toolbox, but there's one, there's one as a gift. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Yeah. Do you know uh, Randy Olson's and but therefore? <laughs> yes, and the <laughs> the the guys at, uh, 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 at South Park use that as well, yeah. and that's a perfect example of the open loop and close and closing the loop, right? And what Jeff is saying is like it's like this thing happened, therefore this thing happened, but then this happened, therefore this happened, right? One thing leads to the next. It's a great great tool. Yeah, yeah, that that's one of my favorites. Uh, I teach that to my students because it's, okay. it's, you know, according to, according to Randy, and I think he's, uh, I think he's correct here. I mean, it's basically if you use the strict and, but therefore we did this and we did this, but we couldn't do this because of that. So we had to do this other thing that's and, but therefore that's essentially sets up a, uh, a one sentence story, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so look, looking at, you know, what, what do you add and what do you not add? You could reduce it down to, to just that. Absolutely. Right? And Absolutely. Then, then, like you said, add, add, add in some of the different tools there once you have mastery of them. I, I assume you're talking about written stories or um, not just off the cuff. I'm just standing around with you telling you a story. But I'm talking about both. I'm talking about all. Like if you understand the elements of a story, you should be able to, in conversation, tell a story. Remember, it's problem, journey to solve that problem, and a resolution of that problem. Me and you are chatting it up at, at the coffee shop or the bar, a networking event or wherever, and you're like, you know, hey, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a story coach. You're like, okay, no idea what that means. And I say, well, you know, I'll give you an example. I was you know, working with a client the other day. This is what they do. And here's what we did together, the journey to solve the problem. And here's how we solved it. And now she's off doing this. There's a story. Yep. Gave you the problem, gave you the journey, gave you the resolution, you know? And, and so it's practice. And, and what I often say is, because trust me, I still get those clients like, we need help telling our brand story, Mr. Rain Bennett. Can you help us? And I'm like, sure, ABC company. But I don't want to teach you how to play, you know, uh, heart and soul on the piano. Like, I don't want to teach you how to play one song in the piano. I want to teach you how to make music. I want to teach you how to read music so that you can sit down and play any old song that you want to and maybe, just maybe, write your own music, right? I don't want to teach you how to regurgitate one story. I want to teach you how to understand how to see the opportunity for stories all around you and seize those opportunities when they present themselves in order to do the things that you're trying to do. Right. I'm giving you gems here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think that I think that networking scenario is a really good one because I, you know, one of the things that happens in professional services and in real estate as as well as um, a, a slightly different version of this, but most architects will say that a large percentage of their work comes from repeat clients and referrals, mm -hmm. and so. How, how do you get a referral, right? Well, someone has to know your story, remember your story, and be able to repeat your story. And when you go to uh, the networking event, for for instance, and you run into that person that, that says, I do this, and 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 I do, and it just becomes this list of things. You're Beyond three things, you're not going to remember it. And that's not a story. And so it makes it very hard to remember any of that. So I think that's when, um, you know, what you're talking about there, Rain, becomes really critical for people um, that need to maximize the ability for others to repeat their stories mm -hmm. and to, to, to bring others in, into, the, uh, into the loop, I guess. This is a great point. Stories are relatable, memorable, and repeatable. And the repeatable is the key because that's what allows them to spread, right? For people to share them. It's just like the old game of telephone or gossip where if you have one person, you know, going down the line saying a word or a message, it gets distorted by the third or fourth one, especially if it's a list of data. Here's another thing get, people get wrong is people tend to think it's like information based or fluffy, feel-good marketing storytelling. They're not mutually exclusive. They should never be. Storytelling is how we communicate, right? Storytelling is simply a way of conveying that information, this information, this list of, of bullet points, by packaging it in a nice, pretty narrative with a little bow on top, 
right? That's how you deliver it because that's how we as humans receive it in terms of communication. So you still, you, yes, of course, you have to get this, this information across or most of it. Sometimes you don't have to get all the information you think you do across, like how many employees you have or, you know, something like that. People love to talk about themselves and your audience doesn't care. They care about themselves, right? But there are inform there is information you need, you need to get across. You package it in a story, just like we said with the sensory details. When you patch package it with a story that appeals to emotion, that's what causes us to remember it. And when you package it in a little shape and not a line or a list, but a little shape of a narrative in an arc, I can take that little arc and pass it on to someone else. But if I take that whole long list and try to carry that list of 17 things, I'm going to fumble most of them by the time I get it to the next person. Instead, you give it to me one little arc. I just pick it up and drop it over to Jeff. Jeff takes it, drops it over to Catherine, and that's how stories spread. Yeah, I think that's a good point. War Warren says like a movie trailer, and I think that's it, right? It's we, I need I need to see enough of that movie trailer to understand what the movie is about, to remember what the movie is about, and then to ask Rob down the street. He and I, uh, since their twins were born, we've we have started um, basically planning his escape <laughs> when, when possible and we'll go see a movie that we we like to see down at, at the uh, imax theater so i may see the movie trailer and go hey rob might like this i know i might like this yeah. and I, now i can tell him what it's about and ask him if he wants to uh wants to go down to the imax with me and, and watch that yeah. movie yeah. yeah anybody ever been to a conference been to a speech or presentation and afterwards if someone was like hey you were in that uh that session right what was that about and you're like I, I don't know. Yeah. You don't even know what to say because it was just nothing but like slides full of text for 60 minutes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Versus if you tell good stories and those universal themes, right, Catherine, like we talked about are, are evident or clear, then they can say, Oh, it was about letting go in your business. So you can do your best work. Right. And now Rob or whomever gets it and like, Oh, cool. I wish, I wish I'd have gone to that one. Maybe I can watch the replay. Right. Yeah. But otherwise we can't just don't remember. And this, this goes back to like our primitive selves. Like we, it cost energy and calories to, to digest information. And if we can't tell, and this is how we've always been as humans, as homo sapiens, if we can't tell quickly that something is going to help us or hurt us, we will discard that information folks. So if I don't see that this, this video is going to be helpful for, for me, I'm out. I'm swiping past it, right? That's all we care about. And so if it's just boring, endless list of information, we won't even try to understand it or digest it. Yeah. We don't care. Yeah, I think in, in this day and age, and it, it, it's moving more and more in that direction. That's really important to understand. Mm -hmm. I, we're, we, uh, actually, I was going to say we're screaming towards the top of the hour. We have screamed past the top of the hour suddenly um but maybe if you've got a minute i think i would want to ask one more question mm -hmm. about um you know professional services that's that's where we are right architects uh mm -hmm. engineers accountants attorneys um there's there's often this tension between professionalism and personality you know, I'm a professional. I've got to hold up my professionalism. How much of my personality can I put into this or should I put into this? And maybe humor is, could be a part of that if that's part of your personality. Mm -hmm. where, where, do you, where do you stand on walking that line between being professional, but still, you know, you were talking earlier about connecting with people. I often use the term aligning with people, you know, our, mm -hmm. our, beliefs and our things are, are similar where do you fall on that line yeah. between how much personality do you put into this i think it's way more important than it's ever been and i think it's a lot less important to be what we think as professional these days this 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 old concept that we had of like no your business is personal you know like no the lines have been blurred a long time ago okay and personal branding is is a is a great opportunity to find your ideal audience which we've talked a lot about today okay however there is a line of oversharing right you don't need to share every gory detail about your story you want to communicate with people and make it about them you don't want to make it all about you 
but you do want people to respond to you and find your unique perspectives that appeal to them, right? So there was, uh, not was, there is uh, a, a marketing you know, guru, if you will, uh, Seth Godin. Many of you might, might know Seth and his work. If not, he's been a guest here. Oh, that's right. I knew that. I'm sorry. Of course, we know that. No so I don't need to give him any any preamble, any preface. Uh, so Seth says this really uh, well. It's like it's not really about authenticity, but consistency, right? And he said, and actually, I was at an event, small event that he he was speaking at, uh, and he said this to us. He was like, you know, and people, this has now come out as like a truth but at the time not a lot of people knew that. he's like you know i hear that ellen is not really a nice person he was like if you tell that to friend you know how he talks to he's like if you tell that to friend like people who are fans of ellen like they will come for you with the pitchforks right like they will they this blasphemy because consistently ellen is the jokester the dancer right they have fun but like when yeah, you talk yeah. to the people who work with her like and I don't know her, you know what I mean? But like now it's stories have started to come out, but he's like, it's not, if she was authentically herself, you yep. know, as, yeah. it wouldn't be the same thing. Right. And then I'll give you an example now from my uh, journey or, or point of view. It also takes a little dab, a little trial and error to find the right recipe for what works for you. So know what your values are. Be yourself. Don't be afraid to be yourself because of professionalism. That is a hard stop, I feel like, after that. But like everything, there's sensitivity. There's knobs, right, that you dial it up and ramp it up or you dial it back. So I love comedy. I always have. And I noticed that in my content, if I ramp that up a little too much, it does. It falls flat. It doesn't work. It's not because I'm not funny. I'm hilarious, folks. You should probably know that by now. But <laughs> If I make it too much of the brand, it just doesn't work. When I am passionate and heartfelt and 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 talk about the things that I love, but it's more on that heartfelt level with a sprinkle of comedy, that's my recipe. It works really well. But whenever I've tried, it could be in a simple Instagram post or a video or whatever. When I try to go too hard with the comedy, it didn't quite resonate with the people I was trying to impact. It might have resonated with the wrong people. So then I'm like, oh, I'm starting to get the recipe now. Then once you get the recipe, you just you play the hits, you know, you hit, you hit that button over and over and over again. So it takes a little bit of work to, to find out, but I will say lean into yourself because again, we're trying to figure out what you do differently, find out why you do what you yeah. do, but no, there is a point where you don't need to be completely authentically yourself. I mean, if I told everything that I do or have done, or you know what I mean? Come on. We don't want to know all those gory details. Yeah. There's, there's oversharing. Yeah, if I tell over, all the stories about uh, me and Kermit in uh, high school, that you know, I would have no <laughs> clients. <laughs> so it's good to know. <laughs> but some, some people might not be authentically very good people, and that's why they need to be dancey and funny and everything. So in some cases, maybe you need to cover up your authentic self for success. Yeah, or find or find what you you really are. I mean, that's a, that's a tough one, right? You're right. Sometimes people aren't authentically, but pe I will say this audiences are more tuned in to what's real to, or not than they ever have been before. So they will sniff out BS far in advance. And so yeah. if you aren't, and listen, you can be a, a, um, what's, what's, you know, a curt, you know, sharp tongue individual. And that works. You'll find your people. You don't have to be a super nice person or do what Ellen, like there's room. It takes all kinds. There's room for us yeah. all. You know, you look at the Gary V's of the world that drop F bombs, every other word, you know, he's found his people, right? You look at people that are just hard nosed and you're going to have people that are like, look up to them because of their tenacity and their hustle mindset, right? You'll find your audience. You don't have to be not yourself but you just don't have to be the hyped up super shredder version of yourself. <laughs> it's, it's a teenage Remember that Catherine, no throwback. super shredder. Okay. <laughs> I'm a nineties kid. What can I say? <laughs> There's Christian asked the question. I'm going to, this is a yes or no, I suppose, but yeah. I'm going to ask this because it's, it's a nice segue uh, to, to a preview that we've got coming up here. So Christian wants to know, have you been on the moth? Yeah, I wanted to answer that one. I'm glad you did. So no, because there's not one very close to me. The closest to me is in Asheville, which is about three, three and a half hours away. Uh, and now I know the host of that. So maybe I should try it. However, there is a local version uh, in Durham, North Carolina called the Monty. And when I started getting into the storytelling space, I was like, I think I want to go do this. 
and uh, I, so I competed in story slams for a, a few of them. I haven't done them in a while. I was thinking about going this Friday. We may or may not go. Um, and then the pandemic obviously stopped live events for quite a while. But in 2018 or 19, 17, maybe who knows? Uh, the first one I ever did, I won. Uh, wow. And I will say it was because not only it was a good story, it's a great story uh, and well structured, etc. But the main thing I knew I knew I was going to win because the theme was secrets and everybody's story. There's eight storytellers per evening and everybody's story was comedic in tone about funny little secrets, or, you know, hiding this thing from my mom when I was a kid. And mine was heavy. We don't need to give you all the gory details. You can find it online if you want to go watch it. But it was some real stuff and it was heavy. And I knew that going against the grain was going to be powerful enough for me to take home the gold. Again, mm -hmm. it was a good story. It was exactly five minutes. Like all the the, the logistics were were intact. But I think that's what separated it because you couldn't even compare it to the other ones, right? It was in another league. Yeah. yeah. Not because it was so much better, but it was. But because it was so much <laughs> different, they couldn't compare it to all the funny ones because it's like, whoa, this was like nothing else of the night. Therefore, it stood out. That's a really good lesson. That's a very good lesson for those of you that are that compete for projects. Think about how you apply that uh, that lesson to the interview with your with your yes. potential client. Sometimes specifically choosing to do the opposite of what everyone is doing yeah. is what's going to set you apart. Everybody's telling comedy, so I have to tell a comedic piece, and you've already lost. You've yeah. already lost because you didn't reach that organically. But sometimes it can be a strategy. That's why as they were going on and telling the stories, I was like, oh. Oh, I think I got this. If I just do it well and don't get stage fright, like I got it in the bag because yeah, yeah. it's they're not even going to be ready for it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great lesson. I'm I'm glad that we we have wrapped it up that way. The reason the reason I wanted to ask that question number one was because I was I was also curious about that, and I hope that you do uh, go to Asheville at some point and get on the moth. But next Friday. Uh, those of you who are Context and Clarity regulars know that we have the Context and Clarity Book Club, and the book that we're reading for the month of May is uh, Sorry I'm Late, I Didn't Want to Come by Jessica Pan. Um, it's essentially the story of an introvert spending a year doing extrovert things acting out, you know, acting the way an extrovert would. And one of the things that she did was get on the moth stage in, uh, uh, in, in England, I forget mm -hmm. the, is, is in an old church. Um, not easy to do. No, yeah, exactly. Not easy to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so that, that was the, the little bit of a segue. And, uh, so we'll have that book club conversation next Friday. We'll also have Jessica Pan as our context and clarity live guest on Thursday, June 2nd. So, I just wanted to throw those out there with that connection to the moth. Can, can I say one more thing? I'm so sorry. Absolutely. Sarah, Sarah says this great line and it's so uh, uh, pertinent for all business owners. So, and I'm not, I won't list the whole list. So we, as an architects, so we have to be good at design, creative problem solvers, know about law, contract, et cetera. Yeah. Welcome to business. First of all, Sarah Lee, it's small business. That's what it is. Okay. I'm yep. sorry. I'm not trying to be like rude, but that's, you, we, yeah, it sucks. Yep. We have to know how to do everything. But then she says, and we also need to know how to be good storytellers. I'm going to stop you right there. You already are a storyteller because you are human. Full stop. Okay. You just have to practice telling your stories. This is innate. This is inherent in humanity. So you're already a storyteller. So go ahead and take that out of your mind. This isn't something you have to learn. You may have to unlearn some things that you have put on top of it, but you already are a storyteller. You just, you just got to start telling your stories. Okay. Well, and Sarah Lee in particular, it already is a good storyteller. Oh, so, so she's just being hard on herself, which is also what us business owners yeah. like to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I, I think that's, the, aware that's fair. Yeah. She is. Sarah Lee, hit me up. I'll talk to you more about it anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very good. Rain, thank you for <laughs> I love this conversation, by the way. This was super this is, fun. No, thank you. It it has been fun. And thanks for for uh dropping so many knowledge bombs on us. It's it's been really it's been really good. Uh I encourage everybody out there, number one, check out Rain's book, Six Second Stories. Um, go over to there you go. Go over to TikTok, find Rain Bennett on TikTok, Instagram as well, and um and learn more. Learn more from him. 
you hear me all the time talking about uh, the the Donald Millers of the worlds and the Seth Godins of the worlds and the Randy Olsons and so on and so forth. Rain is synthesizing all of that in what he does and uh, making, of course, on TikTok, making it bite size and and consumable and and understandable there. So, uh, Rain, thank you for uh, joining us in this conversation. I've loved it. Uh, it's been uh, quite enlightening, I think, for all of our audience and appreciate you for uh, for doing this with us today. It was, I sincerely mean that it was an absolute pleasure. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. I, I have uh, enjoyed it as well. And for all of you out there, I have to say thank you to you as well. Uh, I say this every week and I mean this every week. It is because of you that we are able to have conversations with people like Rain. Right. It's it's you showing up every day. It's you showing up and commenting and asking questions and participating in these conversations that allow us to reach out and to to bring in great people like Rain Bennett to these conversations. So thank you to all of you. Appreciate you for this conversation. Uh, my hope is that all of you will be well. You'll stay safe. You'll keep those around you safe and well. You take a little bit of time to breathe and relax, find some way to get rejuvenated because we're going to do this all over again tomorrow. <laughs> so until then, uh, everybody have, depending on where you are in the world, I see Bright has joined us from Ghana. Bright, thanks for the uh, the three cheers there. Uh, so Bright, have a great night. Everybody else, depending on where you are in the world, have a great day, a great afternoon, a great evening, and uh, hope I'll see you somewhere sometime soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>